Mr. Burkhart. Uh, boy, whenever you start talking about taking somebody's property rights away, um, or they're perceiving that their property rights taken away, it, it's a very emotional issue. And um, for me, on this particular item, I, I'm all for protecting the historical sites, and, and I don't have a lot of problems with what's proposed here today, except as it relates to individual homes that are currently occupied. And um, as far as, as I can tell, most of the true historic sites that we're interested in protecting are not owner-occupied homes. They're the things that have been mentioned, railroad tunnels, oil wells, Oak of the Golden Dream, those kinds of things. And I would like to uh, throw out there that we keep all these potential things on the list. Any of the uh, work that would be proposed to be done on one of these homes would require a permit anyway. And the minor use permit, if we could perhaps waive the fee for the minor use permit on these owner-occupied homes and make sure that we've got an appeal process that allows the homeowner to bring this up to the Planning Commission should there be a, a denial of what they want to do, I think that might make people feel a lot more comfortable um, that are in the, the owner-occupied home category of this until we get the full ordinance that we're looking for where we have the definite criteria where we can weed out what's truly historic and important and what's just simply old. So that's my two cents. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, any MUP is automatically appealable to Planning Commission unless it's already in front of the Planning Commission. So you wouldn't need to add anything with respect okay. to that. The, the fee waiver tonight, you're considering whether to recommend this ordinance for adoption of the council or not recommend it. Um, uh, whether you vote to recommend or not recommend, certainly you could include uh, a recommendation concerning a fee waiver, if that's your pleasure. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ostrom. Well, actually, uh, my questions have already been answered, uh, and I, I had the same concern that uh, Commissioner Burkhardt had. Okay, Commissioner Troutman. Um, I agree <coughs> with what's been said. I want to see the right properties preserved, too, but I think three years is a very long time for as you say, owner-occupied, and for potential. And I'm just wondering, you said that it could be expedited, correct? So within a year's time, perhaps, even? Or it just really depends on what the council decides they're going to do? I can't speculate at this time. Commissioner Trotman, if the City Council directs staff to pursue a full comprehensive ordinance that will likely require a consultant contract to go out and do a, a full complete survey of historic resources uh, throughout the City of Santa Clarita, if not the Santa Clarita Valley. Um, those surveys tend to take some time. Uh, there will be a, a, a very involved community outreach process that goes along with this. And then there's the uh, phase that would involve the actual drafting of the ordinance, the development of uh, restrictions and regulations that go along with that ordinance. So a year's time, I, I think, is, is too ambitious. I think that we... Under best case scenario, we're looking at two to two and a half years. But we can certainly, as part of the recommendation to the City Council, include a provision in our agenda report that indicates that there is a desire on the part of the Planning Commission to expedite this process, and that if, at some, at a, if we're able to complete this process at an earlier time, then this process would go away and would be superseded by the ordinance. Okay. Well, I, I would like to recommend um, an expedited process, and I, and I do agree that I was thinking about that, too, what uh, Commissioner Burkhart said about waiving the, uh, the fee for the MUP for owner-occupied. So I think that that should be, I agree, that should be a recommendation. Um, You know, again, I want to see properties preserved, too, but I want to make sure that uh, homeowners aren't left hanging and property owners aren't left hanging while they wait for something. And I would like to recommend that we, you know, go ahead and, and promote uh, an ordinance uh, that's created that includes some, some benefits in addition to some, um, you know, punishments for something that 
abuses the property. So, thank you, uh, Mr. Montez. Can you answer one other question that was brought up that I just didn't know what it meant? Um, Mr. Uh, Robert Coley brought up the word ra, uh, ralupa. Is Arlupa, that Arlupa rhymes with chalupa. Yeah, that. Oh, there you go. Uh, Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. It's a federal law that was adopted, as you can tell, uh, started out as two bills, ended up as one. Um, it uh, basically is federal law that says that you can't adopt a um, ordinance or a law that works to prohibit or unreasonably impair the exercise of religious practices. And in, in, in terms of land use, uh, what it means is um, it's typically applied to situations where you adopt uh, things like height restrictions that would not effectively would not enable churches to locate because of steeples and things like that. Um, generally, the exception to our lupa is if it's a law that applies across the board to all categories of land use and it's not specifically targeted to uh, religious practice, then generally that's been held to um, withstand the concerns of our lupa, but our lupa is uh, four or five years old now, so uh, there have only been a few cases on it. It's kind of an evolving area of the law. But again, to the extent somebody were to have a concern that this ordinance uh, um, runs afoul of our lupa with respect to a particular church property, that's probably something that would be developed in the course of an MUP process or in connection with some kind of application to do something. And you could do a more detailed analysis at that time. And if it, in fact, was violative of our lupa, you would simply not apply the ordinance to that particular use. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sure. Mr. Hernandez, we um, often have uh, special meetings um, and tours and things like that on properties. I really believe that we made a mistake on this by not seeing a tour and having one or two ways it could have done. We could have taken a tour beforehand and seeing each property and having you describe this and why each one of these properties. I can see almost a majority of these properties I understand. I think all of us in this room understand there's certain ones that stick out like this. But when there's homes that we're talking about, and, and I, I want a description in a minute of why um, Mrs. Hudson's home qualifies. I just want to hear what that one, how it qualifies. But if we went on a tour and you were to stop by this house <coughs> and you say, this house qualifies because of this, and we move on, make it a lot easier these tours or else you could have put I think uh, 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 in our in our brochures today a picture of each property with a description of why and and I make that recommendation so because all we're doing tonight is is suggesting to the one way or another to the city council um, and so I think if the city council has the same questions that we have I think it'd be nice to present them with some of that with that, can you answer my question on, on just uh, on on Mary Hobson's house? Because uh, there's not no description of anything we received on why that one home is considered historical. Sure, if you don't mind, can I get her address? Thank you. The address, 22908, was located on the, this is, bear with me. The California Historical Resources Information System, South Central Coastal Information Center Registry. Based on its age, that was identified, built in 1910. So it's age only? Correct. Oh, okay. 1910. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions or comments? It, it looks like they're looking for direction from us on passing this to the um, the city council. Um, there's been a few uh, other ideas brought up, uh, including the uh, the fee on the MUP and uh, and on the homes. Um, I think why don't we talk about that real quick, if you don't mind? Um, I know that a couple of you have said that, that that's not a problem. I, I feel the same way. I feel very <laughs> Much as, as Tim has said tonight, uh, that if it's a home, I'd rather have that uh, looked at twice. So is there any other comments on that before we? You know, I just have a more fundamental concern. Uh, the, uh, the 
avoidance of the fees may be a somewhat of a palliative, but I am concerned about property owners who now out of the blue, we are going to force into a position of being in purgatory for three years. They don't know what they can or cannot do for the long term with their property. In the meantime, they're going to be treated as if it is on the list for a three-year period, and then it may or may not be on the list after that. And I just have a concern about that, especially since we haven't even established a criteria yet by which we're going to adjudicate what's on, what stays on the list and what isn't. It seems to me we've got the cart before the horse. Now, I can understand the rush here from the historian's perspective, like, well, we might lose something, so let's just stop everything, and then we'll sort it out and keep the goodies and then let the others go. But I don't think that's fair to the existing property owners. I, I don't have that sense of fairness, at least yet, in this, in this uh, proposal. So I'm concerned about that. I guess I, I, I feel the same way, and in, in my looking at it, I, I see that anything that a, that a homeowner would be doing to their home that would be a significant alteration or a demolition would require a permit anyway, would require a permit process where they would have to come down and, and have reviewed what it is they want to do. This is, you know, by waiving the fee and going through the MUP, we're, we're adding a little bit of burden to it. but. We're, we're really not telling people that they can't do what they originally intended to do. In other words, these, these folks that are here tonight, we're not telling them they can't do to their home what I would like to do to my home. We just have to look at it, have one more person look at it, go through the MUP process. I'd like to make the MUP as less burden, as less of a burden as I can, still allow them to, to make their alterations. And in that process, if we find that there is a significant reason beyond the age, identified it and if it's just the age I'm, I'm going to say that I would think that this would sail right through if it doesn't sail right through staff then it comes to us and then they'll have to explain to the Commission why what's significant beyond being built in 1910 that will not allow this this folks these folks to put an addition on the back of the house I, I, I agree that it's it's um, disturbing on its face, but I think in the actual implementation, I don't think it's going to be a huge burden if, if we put in these, these couple of things that we spoke about. Well, at least I, I think we heard at least from one respondent tonight uh, of an issue, and that was from the, the uh, Queen of Angels Church, which, who, who uh, essentially would be prohibited from demolishing and rebuilding on that site, this proposal, correct? So that is an inhibiting of, of a property owner's inherit right, I think, that that maybe is avoidable and maybe is, is is not fair. But, I mean, that's just one. I understand, uh, you know, the MEP process for anything that's going on. But it, it's it's a different. bigger deal to me for people in their homes than, than it is for for commercial properties, like like the church. Not, not that I disagree, either that it's going to be another, you know, big hang-up for someone in the church or with a commercial property, but it, it really gets to me when you're talking when you're talking about a home any comments either of you well i i, I think the uh the how the home thing is is really clear cut i think with the church um it does add the, that one more step where they could come before a um you know a group of peers uh who who don't necessarily have um uh, the you know the, the the historical drive, but just more of a you know an average uh, uh, cross section of the uh, community to to review what their plea was, and uh, they a lot of what they were doing sounded very reasonable to me, and so um, I, I would just say that uh, for the homeowners and for the churches and business, uh, this additional step. Um, if it was basically free, uh, would would uh, and if it was uh, expedient, I mean, made quickly, they don't have to wait six months and stuff like that. Uh, I, I think that uh, they would be um, uh, they they may be surprised that um, the, the 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 backing they would get. I mean, I I I think that it would be left to the city to and and the historical society to to prove value in this. Okay. Um, I agree that if that, you know, I think that the permitting fees or the, the uh, review fees, and it is review, so I agree with what Commissioner Burkhart said, 
that, that those should be waived. I tend to think of that as being for the home, but I also agree that what the church was trying to do seemed reasonable and that, you know, in I don't normally say that you can waive parking requirements, but when you have a structure like that and there's historical value, something has to be given up to, in acknowledgement of that. So maybe you have to consider that the parking has to be adjusted for that church and maybe some things have to be adjusted and that contributing the fee, the city contributing the fee for that review is a recognition of the value that the city gets back in preserving those properties. So so I would agree that, you know, I, I would be willing to consider a uh, waiver of the processing for all of the properties if that's the will of the commission. Commissioner Kennedy, do you have any more comments? No. Okay. Um, with that, I, I think if I'm not mistaken from what I read, that this is uh, something that the city council asked for, uh, asked the city for, staff for. Staff has done their homework, and now they and they put together a team and that, that they have brought to us. They brought it to us now, and I think that w we, I, I think most of us believe that we need something out there for the uh, to, uh, in the future, and this is just the start. Um, with that, I'll, I'll accept any motion that someone would like to make with uh, pass this on to the council with a couple of the additions that we talked about. I'll make the motion that we adopt staff recommendation uh, with the amendments we discussed regarding fee waiver. Um, what was, Diane, wasn't there something that you had on there other than, than waiver of the fee? Um, no, I was looking... Uh, And to direct staff yeah, to expedite the, the process. Oh, the, expediting, the, okay. The final right. ordinance. Thank you. And, and the appeal question was answered by, by Mr. Montez. So oh, okay. Those, those, two, was... those two amendments, I would make that motion. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Let me just make sure with our attorney. And a clarification, that's fee waiver on all MUPs or owner-occupied residential? I heard both, so how did you? Well, you know, th this is a stopgap measure. And... Um, uh, maybe that would be something that would be at the discretion of the Planning Commission for non-residents. Because I don't want all of them to see a big test flood of, um, of challenges. Well, well okay, so, so, so basically, if, if we, uh, I think if we agree with what, what they say, possibly that would be a criteria then we, we could also waive the fee. If, uh, if it was a, uh, a, uh, some, uh, basically a, a challenge that really wasn't, um, you know, in, in our opinion, really wasn't, uh, uh, it was more of a time waster, then, then we would have the discretion of, of holding the fee. A quick question. Did, did we not discuss that the, uh, the MUP fee was $2,300 and that that would be applied in lieu of further development fees? The process now for any MUP, if an applicant has submitted a full project where the MUP fee is not double charged, it then becomes part of the formal project application in the fees associated with that one project. Okay, so then it sounds like to me that in, in the terms of a, of a commercial or, or a big project, we're, we're covered on that, but really looking out for the, really, yeah. the homeowner who wants to put on a new roof yeah. That $2,300 is a, is a heck of a hit. Yeah. So, yeah, I, so my motion would be that we would waive the fee for owner-occupied homes that are on this yeah. list. Yeah. I'd buy it. And, and, and expedite is the other and, thing. And the expedition, and expediting the final or, or a more enhanced ordinance. Right. So we have a, a first and a I'll second. I'll second that. Uh, any other conversation? Okay, not hearing that. Mikey, can we do, please do a roll call? Commissioner Burkhart? Yes. Commissioner Ostrom? Yes. Commissioner Troutman? Yes. Commissioner Kennedy? No. Chair Berger? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time tonight. Uh, we appreciate all of your input. Thank you. Okay, at this time we have the planning manager report. Ms. Weber. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Berger and Commissioners Lisa Weber with the city's community.
Community Development Department. Um, just a few items for you this evening. At our last City Council meeting, we had a, a few planning related items uh, before the City Council. They did conduct their first reading of the ordinance for the Unified Development Code amendments. And there are a few notable changes uh, from the set of amendments uh, that the Planning Commission reviewed and recommended for approval. One of those has to do with uh, a requirement, a, a state law requirement related to homeless shelters. If you remember, uh, we looked to, in compliance with state law, uh, make homeless shelters uh, permitted by right in one land use zone, and that again is a requirement of state law. That was removed uh, from the UDC amendments uh, presented to the City Council, and a decision has been made that is that that would better be handled through our update to the housing element. Uh, so that, that process is uh, moving forward. Uh, in fact, we do have a community meeting on our uh, housing element and our uh, housing goals and policies scheduled for next Tuesday evening. Um, another notable change was with regard to telecommunications equipment. Um, if you remember, there was a modification to encourage uh, telecommunications equipment in areas where there were already, where there could be co-location opportunities. It was a reduction of the uh, permit requirement from a CUP down to a minor use permit, again encouraging them in areas where they would be fully screened and co-located as opposed to looking at a, a a new area. That item was also removed uh, from the UDC amendments. And then a, a notable uh, change uh, added to our uh, code has to do with public noticing and special noticing requirements. And uh, uh, 30 days following the second reading of this ordinance, which will occur uh, in late September, all current city council members and all current planning commissioners will receive notices, uh, the public notice, uh, for all conditional use permits and minor use permits uh, that are pending. So uh, keep your mailboxes clean. <laughs> Um, also, uh, the City Council <coughs> made committee appointments at their last City Council meeting, and I'm pleased to announce that uh, Bill Kennedy was reappointed uh, by Mayor Bob Keller, and uh, our new council member, Lori Ender, appointed uh, a new commissioner named Dee Dee Jacobson. Uh, they will uh, be sworn in prior to the September 2nd, 2008 Planning Commission meeting, and we will likely have a, a meet and greet with all of the planning commissioners and the city planning staff. So stay tuned for that information. Uh, just a reminder that uh, before you go on your summer break, you've got one more Planning Commission meeting, and that's scheduled two weeks from tonight on July 29th. July 29th, and on that evening, uh, we do have a fairly full agenda. It will include the Master's College Master Plan and a few other uh, development projects before you. Also, prior to that meeting, given that that will be our chair's uh, last meeting as uh, planning commissioner, uh, serving out uh, almost a 10-year term, uh, we will have uh, a uh, small celebration prior to that meeting. Thank you. And uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, commissioners. Okay, thank you, Planning Manager. We appreciate all that. Um, but any any uh, comments from the commissioners? Reports? No. We do have public comment tonight. Mr. Alan Cameron, welcome back, Alan. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Berger. Uh, my schedule is such that I'm not sure that I'll be able to be here on the 29th of July. So uh, this may well be my final opportunity to address the Planning Commission when it uh, benefits from the extraordinary presence of uh, Michael Berger. And I did want to make a, uh, a brief observation about that. Uh, I'm not quite sure why anybody would elect to serve on the Planning Commission. Uh, certainly it's not a self-aggrandizing motive that uh, would motivate such a service. The desire for wealth or recognition probably would not be high on the list either. Uh, even the most cynical observer would have to say that the motivation has to do with the desire to make this community and the planet we inhabit better. And uh, in the experience that I've witnessed, some 20 individuals have served on the Planning Commission. 
As a matter of fact, just a, as an aside, given the uh, focus on historical issues that has occurred here tonight, I would not be uh, anything but supportive to see some kind of plaque on the nicely open space accented walls of this chamber that would list the people who elected to serve this community so ably on the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission so that after their service was completed, their names would be available for recognition and appreciation by all who visit their uh, seat of self-government. But uh, same thing also perhaps for members of the city council. The mayor's photographs are on the uh, room next door, but I'm not aware of uh, any location where anyone who has served on the city council has their name uh, memorialized here in this, uh, in this place. But uh, Commissioner Berger's tenure has been remarkable. I believe that he is the only person in city history who was appointed to this position by three different members of the city council. Please correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I believe that is the case. And that certainly is a unique kind of affirmation as to the uh, special qualities that Mr. Berger has brought to this position. And uh, in conclusion, uh, generations yet unborn, people who may not recognize Mr. Berger, whether or not names of planning commissioners are indeed emblazoned on one of these walls, will have benefited from his service. This community is considerably better off because of what he's done. I think we all owe him a debt of gratitude, and uh, I thank you, Mr. Berger. Thank you very much, Alan. Those nice words. Um, with that, I think we'll uh, open it for adjournment. I'll move that we adjourn. Or adjourn. Good night now. Santa Clarita is Southern California's entertainment destination. Just minutes from LA, Santa Clarita's year-round weather means you can enjoy year-round fun. Like thrilling coasters and water parks, premium shopping, destination day spas, fine dining, outdoor adventure, and major events such as wine festivals, golf tournaments, and the Cowboy Festival. Santa Clarita, always in season. Before the party, the decorations and the cake and the balloons and everything, and I was rushing. Carlos was rushing like mad, and I, I turned around just for one second, and there was a really loud whistle. I slammed on the brakes. He came one more. I was Look, listen, and live, or someone you love will get hurt. Sweetheart, you're safe. Rancho Camulos, Ventura County's first historical landmark, was a Mexican land grant awarded in 1839. History lives on at the 13-acre museum of Rancho Camulos. Take a tour highlighting the rancho's operation under three generations of the Del Valles. Visit the birthplace of Ventura County's first working winery and learn about the mysterious history of Helen Hunt Jackson's Ramona. Visit RanchoCamulos.org or call 805-521-1501 for information on tours, museum hours, and special events. Located off the 126 in Piru, Rancho Camulos, where hospitality calls home.